Well, people, I'm, I'm set on South Sea, and that's in Hampshire, promenade, trying to catch a red mullet and failing dismally. I parked at the wrong place, couldn't find where I was supposed to go to the red mullet hotspot. I had four hours on the uh, car park ticket, so I'll have four hours. The worms I bought, no fault of the tackle shop, but they are possibly the world record smallest worms I've ever seen. It's windy as anything. Tiny worms. Now my problem being when I put them on the hook they just sort of break up because they're so tiny. They're almost too small. If you had a mullet fishing session you'd give your right arm to have little worms like this. So I've got to put like two or three worms on to get a decent bait. So it's a bit of a problem. The wind's come up. I'm fishing with just one hook and two hook pattern off the rigs, you're throwing out on the edge of the sand, not on the rocks. Tide's low, tide's all wrong, I know it's all wrong, but I had to come anyway. So, not looking good at the present time. So I'm told that the red mullet are pretty much fairly common along here. But they're not common today, are they? I've got the small hooks on, I'm using, just so you know, but they're called Grips, G-O-I-P-Z. You've got a curve shank, these are not quite sure what they're used for. I know they're used for fishing, I know they're used for fishing, Graham, obviously whether it's carp or what it is. These are a size six, but they're curve shank hooks. And they've got little little ridges in there to try and hold, so they're barbless, but those ridges help hold it in place, hook in place. The trouble being, I've used them sea fishing, and of course, the worms are alive, so they can wriggle off the hooks. I'm having to pop the worms over the eye of the hook. I'll show you one. These would be carp hooks. These are freshwater carp hooks, I'm guessing. I just put it there. You can see that curved shape of it, but they're very, very sharp. I like them because they're sharp. Quite a wide gate, very, very strong wire, I feel. And a big eye, so I can put a doubled leader through there. If I bring one, well, I can show you with a bit of scrap line, actually. So a trace I'm using is six kilos, saltwater runner filament, 0.30 mil. Here's what it is. All I'm saying is it's like 12 pound, 13 pound line. So I would normally just put an overhand knot this is how I do it, it's my way of doing it, overhand knot in the end of, say, my fishing line, my leader. And then, thread that through something expendable like this nut. You can use your fishing lead and make a sliding knot there. That's going to pull down, look, like this. So if I do get snagged in the bottom because there's rocky, weedy bits there, I'm just going to lose the weight. Then I would want, let's say I find brass fishing or something like that, I can do a doubled loop like this. Just go through twice. We call it a surgeon's loop there. Okay, so see how it pulls tight? Like that. Now, you can, you can snip there. And if I put it maybe against the sky there, you can see your weight is here. And I've got a single length of line there onto which I can tie this hook on, just like this. I can tie the hook on there. If you have it too long, it will tangle around here. You can have it about three or four inches there. Let's say the hook is there. But of course, if you get decent fish like a big wrasse and he chews through this piece, then you've lost the fish. So what we try and do a lot of the time is to, loop, is to make a blood loop or a double overhand loop just make a one turn like this. This is on our how to tie knots. We've got a couple of good knot tying videos. And you put, let's say, the main line sort of around itself four or five times. 
just like this. Then pull this bottom loop through there. And then you can see here, when you pull that tight, watch. There. That loop stands out at 90 degrees to the main line. So you have two options there. You can either cut the single, um, cut the loop and make it a single, or if you've got a small hook, and herein lies a problem, which I don't get with these grips hooks, is they've got quite a big eye. I can, hopefully you'll see this, very tricky to do, so I've got the camera on my head. You crush the loop down, push it through the eye of the hook, and then I just go through, put the hook through once, twice, watch this. Just pull it like this. Don't really need to wet this one, and that one will stand off nice and neat like that. So you've got, your, you've got your weight at the bottom, it goes down, that's ideal for wrasse, small fish, down the side of piers, jetties, deep water off the rocky headlands, and the hook hangs slightly away from there. Now with small baits, because these worms are absolutely tiny, if you're not casting too far, sometimes it's better, move that down, not to hook through the top end, just to hook about an inch back from the worm, thread it around, and then just leave it popped over the eye just like this. So we're doing it this way, you've got movement above the eye of the hook and movement on the tail of the hook and there's the point, you can see it? So you've got a bit of wiggling worm here, a bit of wiggling worm there. Not great if you're casting a long way, but ideal if you're dropping down piers, harbour walls, rocky headlands, you know, down the side of cliffs and stuff like that into deep water. And you've got movement off of both. Or if you're just throwing it out off the beach, alternately, because this is a barbless hook, just wasted a worm, it's £2.50. You get your worm and you go in through the jaws or the mouth, run it around the bend of the hook. Now you've got to get it over that eye because otherwise it's just going to slide off of a barbless hook. So it's got to go up and over the whole hook like that. Can you see that? And that really is a good way if you're casting a bit farther. So a couple of tips there. And that one will actually stand off. Oh, there goes the hovercraft. Like that. And you can see that. There's my weight. And there is the worm. Now, by using that, that blood loop like that, you can see it just there. If that was on a single length tied on, I'd have to cut that and it'd get shorter and shorter as I tie different hook sizes on. But by pushing it through the loop of the eye and a half inch in it around there, you can actually slacken that loop back look, and take the loop off just like that. So you can change hooks. You haven't damaged this loop here, you can still use it. You get your other hook. You push that loop through the eye like that. Next size might be a smaller hook, might be a bigger hook. Open the loop and just go around it once or twice. It's like snelling a hook. It's called snelling, and you pull down, and there you are. You've changed hook sizes, and you haven't had to cut this back or retie a hook. Just another totally awesome tip. I could do the totally awesome tip on the fishing boys. The red mullet, I'm not showing at all. Guys, save the plank at long last. There we go, in amongst the weed. 
looks like a nice little schoolie bass. Just show them to you there. Wow, I saved the save the blank for the little schoolie bass. And he's obviously digested the hook. He's, uh, he's a little fish, he's going straight back. But thank goodness, I've caught something. It's not the red mullet, but it's something. I have my bait piled on about six or eight worms, trying to make something of it. Might even top this one up. Yeah. Top both those baits up there, you can see. I heave it out there in the direction of whatever's out there. I'm only just using this short rod, which is, it's a popping rod, called a IC Professional SW 2.28, 7 foot 6 long, casting weight 100 grams. It's just thrown out 2 ounces and caught that bass. Short, obviously short. It's a short rod. Thank goodness there's life out there anyway. So this will be my last, last casting session. And then the ticket will be out on the car. I'll go back and have a £35 fine. Another load of weed. My goodness, there's some weed down there. The reason I think I got that fish is purely because the tide's just turned. Yeah, it goes out pretty well, that nut. That's what I'm using. 15 pound line, I think it is. Avon quiver tip rod but without the quiver section. That's what you call a mishmash of tackle, isn't it? Casting popping rod, Avon rod, and another Avon rod. And what good has it done me? I have to come in quite quickly because there's, there's like rocky area just at the base of this slope here, so. Normally you get rast just off there, but I think being there's a low tide, I think that's why I'm not catching fish. It's all about the time, guys. I haven't got time to stay later. So, what exactly are red mullet? I can't catch them in the UK. I've caught them abroad, of course, when I've been on foreign fishing trips. I cannot seem to catch a UK red mullet. Not yet, anyway. What that was, was a really enjoyable, close to a blank, wasn't that? Close, very close to a blank. It happens, it's fishing, at least I was there trying. Now I'm trying to make something for Mike, who wants to stand a tumble dryer up so this wife doesn't have to bend down all the time, it's a little small one. What can I make it out of? What do you think, guys? Smith, what do you think I can make it out of? Free pallet wood? Well, here we are, people. Dressed like this, inside the garage. You know it's cold out there. I certainly know it's cold out there. One degree above freezing. Now, and all those people that live in the northern hemisphere above Alaska and the Arctic Circle say, we get 50 degrees below. Yeah, but you've got to have the good old British damp cold that eats right into your bones. Anyway, a digression into weather again, which is what the British people talk about, weather. I'm going to be making a bench thing, I'm going to call it a thing, for Mike, because he's got a tumble dryer that Emmy keeps bending now, bending now, bending now. It's really annoying. So he said, can you make some sort of table bench thing down out of scrap wood? Yes. He can put the little tumble dryer on the top and she can put the basket underneath. Well, hey ho in lockdown, there's not a lot to do, is there? So I grabbed that job with both hands. So I've got a wheelbarrow full of scrap wood. Some of it's good hardwood, actually. I'm not sure I'll let him have it, actually. I'll see if I can bodge something together with a few good old four inch nails and uh, hopefully it'll do the job for him.
Yes, folks, it's another sad. It's another job done, and without any monkeying about either. Move on to the next one. Well, Mike got a nice stand for his tumble dryer. Brilliant, and all free. But on a really cold day, I like to get outside. I'll do anything just to not be locked down inside. I'm sure a lot of you guys know what it's like, just getting out in the fresh air makes you get through that day so much better. I was out there working away. I wanted to really sort out my plant troughs and pots ready for the impending blazing summer that I was looking forward to way back in the middle of our winter. It was a cold day, but listen, it's just something to do in the lockdown and that's when I filmed this. So it is actually, the frost just clear, but I've had this trouble every year, I get it about once or twice a year. On our patio, I have to keep repointing all the time. Now when we paid the people to do it years ago, it was like what they call dot and dab. I don't know whether they forgot the dots or they forgot the dabs, but I still get pointing to do it, I do it every year. I even tried grip fill in there. I'll show it to you actually, it's been very good. So during lockdown I've been repointing here. And there is some grip fill, which has gone hard because that goes in the crack and stays in the crack. But over here, I'll show you, I'm working my way through, there, look, like this, like this. That's all been done. So it's got to be done again. And when I pull it out, I've done some with building sand, some with sharp sand, that's sharp sand, that one by the look of it. And I thought the sharp sand would work. No, it still comes up all the way along here. It's driving me mad. It's driving me nuts, actually. You can see all the bits here, but I'm, I'm working my way across doing it in stages. You see, I've done all here. I might jet wash it off. I see where I go. I've got to work that way as well. Here's another one, look. Can you see? Look, uh, why is that? Why is it, why is it, why is it doing that? Bizarre, there's no rocking on the, uh, on the slabs themselves. Anyway, I've taken all the tubs off of here. I've tipped them all out and some, the plants didn't do great and I forgot to crock. So I've drained them all out, dried them all out in case there's any bugs there. We're just gonna peel them off here a bit and I'm gonna give them a coat of paint. Now I normally don't do this till about April but I'm so bored, mind-numbingly bored in these lockdowns and forever going on that I'm doing job after job. And I've gotta get that off the lawn, it's gonna mark it. Um, and what I'm also gonna do, some bits of slate I've got left over going to raise them off the ground just so that uh, the air gets underneath which is better and that will be better for plants. Now what I've also done is to mix up, take all the soil out of here because it's good sort of loam soil but it's been in a few years, mix it with compost in the garage, let it go dry, tumble it all over like you would do cement and then refill it. But first I'm going to crop them. I can use either stones or what I have done, I always try and say it's all basic stuff loads of old clay like this you see the old clay pots they'll all go in there like this breakdown i just pop a couple over the hole curve ones over the holes like that and then put some more in there i've got plenty of stones i can put in as well gives it drainage because this year i actually want to try and grow some decent flowers i did the veg last year you guys probably saw some of the shows so no problems potatoes runner beans tomatoes that sort of stuff but they are a pain, they're a pain to do really. They're sort of satisfying, but you just get one harvest, that's it. With flowers, you can sort of look and enjoy them for say, three, four months of the year. Whereas the vegetables, you can get them growing and you're desperate to eat them. And then when you've eaten them, there's nothing else, is there? So this year, boys, I'm gonna go for flowers in the garden. Right, first thing is crop these pots.
Well, it's got them all set up now, so all I've got to do is plant the plants, plant the seeds, see what comes out. They're all there, ready, ready and loaded. A few left over there. So, fingers crossed, we get a good take on the uh, flowers this year. Well, I'm all set to uh, plant the flowers now. Now, what else is it I need? Oh, uh, oh yeah, uh, sunshine, blue sky, some warmth, barbecue, beers, and some fishing. Hopefully, we're going to get it all. See you next time, guys. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button. TA Fishing, TA Outdoors. We'll see you in the next episode.